All right, people, Mr. Wright here with lesson one for percussion. In this lesson, we're going to be studying the basics of music notation. Most of the band will be using what's called staff lines. The high people using the treble clef will have their staff lines. They'll be using the treble clef, and the bass clef folks will be using these staff lines. And down in the bass clef, they'll have two different clefs. And then, of course, the percussion, we have our own little percussion staff. Uh, it's just one line because we're not dealing with high pitches and low pitches yet. And uh, the percussion clef looks like that, two little hash marks. And this right here is what's called a time signature, the top number and the bottom number. It's not a fraction, it's a time signature. The top number tells us how many beats there will be in each measure. From the beginning to this bar line is measure one. From this bar line to this bar line is measure two, and so forth. So. That's the, how many beats in each measure. So there's going to be four beats in every measure in this time signature. The bottom number uh, we take and we divide that, whole, that, that number right there, the four, into this first note. Now this note is a whole note. Notice that it looks like a whole. And I want you to think of this whole note as a standard complete note by which we shall measure all other notes. So this is a whole note and it takes up this whole measure. All right, so we kind of get a clue that mm, this whole note that takes up the whole measure, since every measure is going to receive four beats, mm, that must get four beats as well. This bottom number, we can take it and divide it into this whole note, and when we divide this whole note up, we get four parts or four quarters. So this bottom number tells us that the quarter note will receive the beat. Now, we'll get into quarter notes in a minute. They look different than this guy right here. But this whole note's going to take up the whole measure. And in this next measure, that also receives four beats, there's a dash right there that's called a whole note rest. It's going to receive four beats of silence. So four beats of sound for the whole note, four beats of silence for the whole note rest. And it goes back and forth like so. Um, if we move down, to the, down the page here, uh, I actually show you with arrows these four uh, beats, how each beat is represented with these little four arrows. And there's a little squiggly looking sign underneath them, and it's slanted like that. Those are roll marks, and I'll get into that later in the later part of this lesson to show how we're going to sustain pitches or, or sounds. Uh, the brass and woodwinds, they will blow a constant stream of air through their mouthpiece, causing the lips to buzz or their reed to vibrate or a column of air to vibrate to get a sustained sound. We're going to do it in a different way called rolling, uh, creating a roll. And But we're not going to get into that just yet. But there's four beats of sound in this measure. One, two, three, four, rest. Two, three, four. See, both of them receive four beats. And in my mind, I have to count those four beats. So do I give those notes or the note values their proper uh, length of time that I'm supposed to hold them out? So it's four beats of sound, four beats of silence. And it goes back and forth. Now, down here, measure 17 looks like a whole note, but there's this little stem connected to it. And so these are called half notes. They're half as long as this whole note up here. So this is since this is four beats and these are only half as long, these are only going to receive two beats a piece. And you see these little arrows that represent that. So dun 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 and right here is a what's called a half note rest. Notice up here that the whole note that receives four beats of silence, it's hanging underneath. He's kind of a little bit heavier, so he's hanging underneath. But this half note rest, oh, he's a little bit lighter, so he can sit on top. You can also, you don't really have to say, oh, I can't remember which one's which. Well, just take a look. This whole note rest takes up the whole measure. Hmm, must be a whole note rest. This one right here only takes up half the measure because this half note takes up the other half. So it must be a half note rest. So it kind of gives you a clue as to which one's which. You don't really need to remember where it is exactly on the little staff line there. These are half notes, two beats a piece, two beats of sound a piece, and of course the half note rest. And you can see how that were just kind of different combinations of sound versus the silence. And down here in 25, uh, 25 is just quarter notes, and they are the ones that are different. The quarter notes, they are solid on the inside. They look like a half note but they're solid on the inside. And these are quarter notes that receive only one beat a piece, like 
dun, 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 dun. Then these are quarter note rest. Uh, these little squiggly looking sign things right there. One beat of silence each. So it's dun, 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 rest, two, three, four. Dun, 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 rest, two, three, four. Now, the other thing that we want to cover real quickly in this segment is how to conduct. Notice that this little conducting pattern, a conductor will use this pattern to show you what beat we're on in each measure. So for instance, the first movement they'll do is called the down beat. Beat one, two, three, four. To down to left, right, up. With a baton, uh, this is called a baton, it's a French word. Uh, it's all made of wood. Sometimes they're made of fiberglass, but this one's made of wood. Uh, a baton, they, they'll use this to conduct the beat or to give a cue as to when you're supposed to come in or when you need to stop. But uh, from the tip to your elbow, it's supposed to be straight. You don't want a conductor that conducts like this because where's the beat in that? You need to be able to see this beat pop. Three, four, one, two, three, four. Four. From your perspective, if you are conducting and you need to learn how to conduct, you're going to be down to left, right, up. Down to left, right, up. Now, it's all supposed to be parallel to the floor. I'm kind of aiming my arm up a little bit, angling it up a little bit so that you can see what I'm doing. Down to left, right, up. And you need to have, learn, learn how to do that. So it's down to left, right, up. And with your other hand, uh, you want to learn how to do what's called crescendos, where you get louder, and decrescendos, when you get softer, and how to cut off. You just bring your fingers together. So it's crescendo, two, three, four, decrescendo, two, three, four, and off. Right? So there's a whole uh, study about conducting, but you need to learn how to conduct so that you can understand what they mean, and you'll be able to follow the conductor a lot better if you understand that language. So that's super important to learn how to do that. Now, when we were looking back here at these roll marks, we can't just blow air like the brass and woodwinds to create a sustained sound. We're gonna to have to do something called a roll. So now we're gonna move over uh, to a different area of the studio here to kind of demonstrate what we're gonna do and how we're gonna to have to think in order to perform these rolls. Okay, we're in our next little battle station. First, I wanna start off by talking about your stick grip. This is one of many different types of stick grips. I use a lot of different types of grips as I play different things on the snare drum, timpani, and et cetera. But for just snare drum right now, uh, let's talk about that. If you've got Vic Firth drumsticks, uh, this, a good drumstick to start off with is the SD1 General. Um, these are beat up, my students borrowed them. And, uh, but what you wanna do is wrap your index finger around where the little flag is. Just wrap it around like that, then you kind of close it off with the thumb. Uh, some say have this completely closed off right here. Some say, no, it's got to be open a little bit. Others do different types of grips where they're holding it, uh, this fulcrum access point right here, where it was with this bottom knuckle down here, like so. But uh, I like to, the way I was taught in college is just kind of like so and you close it off with the thumb, and this becomes the fulcrum grip. This is like the spot where, it's, where it pivots at. So when we do rolls, and we have multiple bounce strokes to, to accomplish a roll, we're gonna uh, use that fulcrum grip, and it's pretty tight, okay? I've got it, and I'm sealing it off. So if I'm doing a roll, I'm gonna let each stick bounce like so, and then you just increase that tempo like so. If I'm on a real snare drum, and that's how we get sustained tones. Again, that grip, I'm just grabbing it with my first finger, uh, closing it off with my thumb, and then these fingers are gently wrapped around. If I'm playing single strokes, like if I'm letting this drum, the snare drum stick just strike once, like so, I tend to do a slightly different kind of drip because, uh, grip because I'm thinking in terms of getting ready for single stroke rolls or single stroke rolls on the timpani. So for instance, I would be, I've got the same basic grip, but I'm instead of the, the stick coming to the, the palm of my hand over here, I, I'm kind of aiming it more toward the center. And some professors will say, no, don't do that. But uh, the way I do that or why I do it is because I want it to land right in this little 
part right here between these two fingers. I want it to cradle right there because I'm going to use these two fingers to pop that drumstick in place. If you raise your forearm up just straight up and down uh, and use gravity, uh, you can use that to simulate the, the rebound from a snare head or a timpani head. So you do that and you get that little point, you find that little fulcrum point, and of course the stick will be sticking out about an inch and a half beyond your hand to find that another way if it doesn't have that design or if you've got a different kind of drumstick. But I'm using gravity to simulate that rebound from off the drum head. And I want it to land right there between these two fingers because then I can just use my fingers and all of this stays nice and relaxed. So all of this is just relaxed. You don't want any tension. You don't want to go with your whole arm. Uh, sometimes like when I'm doing a roll, I will use uh, wrist and if I'm doing a loud roll, uh, more of my arms. So it kind of depends on how loud you're playing a roll, how soft you're playing a roll, how you just... It kind of depends on what you're doing. Now, that's the basic stick, stick grip and the beginnings of a roll. You just basically practice with one hand, just pressing that snare drum stick into the head. And really, the only thing that's touching is, is my index finger, first finger, and my thumb. Practice the same thing with both hands, and then and you speed it up, okay? That's to get a roll. Now, if you look at the whiteboard here, uh, this is the whole note roll that we talked about. A quick review, we've got a whole note that lasts for four beats and four four time signature. It, uh, four, and then these are half notes under here. Now, I've attached roll marks. You won't always see the little roll hash marks on there. But uh, I'm just showing you, if we were to do sustained pitches uh, on, the, on or sounds on a snare drum, which was a roll, but four beats, two beats, and uh, these are quarter notes, and I put roll marks on them because we're going to talk about how would you roll on a quarter note. And these are eighth notes. I've not introduced these yet, but this is four beats, two beats, one beat a piece for these quarter notes. And if you cut up one of these quarter notes in half, you get eighth notes. It takes eight of these to make one whole note. So if you cut a whole note into eight parts, you get eighth notes. And these eighth notes are joined together by a single bar, like so. And so you would count a quarter note, one, two, three, four, or you just go tap, 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 or there's roll, we'll get to that roll in a minute, but you go, for an eighth note, you go one and two and three and four and. Now, what if you were to take this whole note and cut it into 16 parts? you would get 16th notes. Notice that they're joined together by two bars. Eighth notes are, get, are joined together by one bar. 16th notes are joined together by two bars. This little cluster of 16th notes, this group of four, is all of beat one. You can fit all four of these notes into one quarter note. You can fit uh, two of these clusters into one half note. This is two beats long. This is beat three and that's beat four. You would count it one e and a two e and a three e and a four e and a like so. So if I were to see this right here, and I was at a moderate tempo, I would want to subdivide this to create a roll. I got to create some kind of a stick motion uh, or hand motion in order to measure out this four beats. So you want to think in terms of if I've got four beats here that I got to fill, then we're going to think of four clusters of 16th notes. One e and a, two e and a, three e and a, four e and a. Two, three, four e and a, like that. And I'm letting the stick bounce uh, two times on uh, each one. I'm going but up, but up, but up, but up. It's a double stroke roll. So, so my stick, my hand motion, or my wrist motion, is one e and a, two e and a, three e and a, four e and a and I've done exactly 16 notes when I count that in my mind. If you just kind of go by feel, you, you may play too short or too long. You want to count. And so this is the way we're going to measure out this time, this, this uh, whole note right here. One e and a, two e and a, three e and a, four e and a. And that will give us, and it also creates a sense of pulse. Even though uh, it's just a sustained tone, uh, with doing that roll with two bounce, uh, a double bounce roll, one e and a, two e and a, three e and a, four e and a, there's a pulse in that. Um, 
that's inherent in that because every time you're doing you can just kind of feel that now later on we work towards a concert buzz roll to where it makes it kind of flatten where it's all kind of just zzz. we'll get to that later but let's just start with this uh, this is kind of throwing you into the deep end of the pool anyway so think in terms of if i'm going to do a half note roll i'm going to do two of these clusters one e and a two e and a and then i've done for i've given it a duration of two beats if you've got a quarter note roll right here, so that's just one of these clusters, one E into two, three E into four. So you go one E into two, three E into four. On a real snare drum, it sounds like one E into two, three E into four. And you'll notice that I drive this note into the next one. Sometimes you'll see it written this way. You'll see like a, just a little slur marking to let you know, yes, that drives right into that, in the roll, right on that beat right there. So we started on beat one, Ended on beat two, started on beat three, ended on beat four. So we go one E into two, the E into four. If you're right-handed, you want to start each one of these measures, each one of these beats with your right hand. If you're left-handed, you want to start with your left hand. In your exercise, it's just a whole note. It doesn't say to roll above it. This is just for you to practice. And uh, if you're practicing with a band, they may just want you to go one, two, three, four, rest, two, three, four. A lot of the other band methods do that, but it's extremely boring and it's a bit of a waste of time uh, on your part. If you can get a practice pad uh, that will bring down the volume level, your director probably won't mind you turning your whole notes into sustained rolls. One e and a, two e and a, three e and a, four e and a. Um, there's different types of pads. This one is just a, a piece of wood with uh, some gum rubber on the top and they put a plate on the back of it. Um, this is just Innovative Percussion Incorporated. I don't get any money from, for advertising, but this is a type of drum pad that you can find. Another one from Off World is the, uh, let's see, it's, it's this one. I forgot, V3, I believe it is. But this one simulates what a marching snare drum would sound like. So you got this one with a metal plate right here with a gum rubber sur surface. It's kind of a little bit older, but... Then this one has more of a... Kind of a, that kind of a that kind of surface to it, and uh, but it's it's the snare drummer, marching band snare drum folks. They they love this type of uh, it's got a rim and everything to practice rim shots, and of course you've got a real snare drum that you can practice with. Any time that you're practicing on a real snare drum, or even on a practice pad like this, uh, you want to be using uh, earplugs. I'm trying to dig in my pants pocket. Here's some earplugs that I like to use. But uh, you always want to protect your hearing. And if you're playing with a group, use a practice pad or you can play very close to the rim. If you want to get louder, you just move away from the rim. Like so. So that's this right here. Now let's move on to the next little battle station. All right, we're here at the piano. You're probably wondering why are we at the piano? Well, because it's a percussion instrument. When you strike a key, there's a hammer on the inside of this instrument that strikes a string, so it is percussive. All right, to begin with, we need to sit up straight, leaning slightly forward. Your arms are gonna be nice and relaxed, and your fingers are gonna be curved like you're holding a grapefruit or a, a ball about this size, okay? So this nice and curved and relaxed. And you'll notice on the keyboard that there are groups of two black keys, then three black keys, two black keys, three, two, three, and it just keeps repeating. Well, surrounding each one of the, the groups of two black keys, there's the notes C, D, and E. And it repeats like I can look for the next group of two black keys and there they are again. C, D, E. Two black keys, C, D, E. And it happens down here too. Uh, two black keys, C, D, E, C, etc. All right. So that's well, how that's found. You can find that the C, the D is always between the two black keys and your E just above them. And also you'll notice the group of three black keys that repeat as well. So you've around this group of three black keys, you've got F, G, A, and B. Up an octave, then F, G, A, B, and it happens the same way down here. Now, 
in the key of C, where we will start off at, we're going to find the, the name of the piano right here, and you can just come right here, and this is your middle C. If you're on a keyboard, it's probably the, the C that's closest to the middle of the keyboard. You find the uh, two black keys, and then just come right to the left to find your C, your middle C, or the pitch will sound like this. Some keyboards have an octave shift button, and if that's depressed one way or the other, it could throw it off. So make sure that you're back at center on your transposition on your keyboard if you have an electronic keyboard. But here's middle C, and what I want to do right now, and let me say this also. This is C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, it's just the alphabet. And so like here's an A, and it, after you hit G, you start over again with the letter A, or the note name A. But we're gonna start in middle C here. Because we're going to go from C to C to play a C scale, like C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. That's a C scale. It's a major scale using nothing but white keys. And that's what we'll use for right now in the key of C. Now, to play this, first chord that I'm going to show you, I'm going to play, use my thumb. And I'm going to leave every finger on each key. That is, each, each finger has its own little key. No, we're not going to do any strange things like that. We're going to leave each finger on its own key. And I'm going to play this first note. Then I'm going to use my middle finger to play this next note. Then I'm going to use my pinky to play this note over here. And I'm skipping every other key. I'm going C, E, G. Notice I'm playing every other note. I'm not playing these guys right here. Just these. Now, there'll be times when you'll need to play... So that's why it's important for every finger to have its own key and not to try to do anything strange like this, like you're some kind of an alien. No. So we... And get used to your fingers being able to achieve that little formation right there. Because then we want to take every finger, just move your whole hand structure up a step to playing every other note from this D to the F to the A. Right. Then I'm going to move my finger, and that's a D minor chord right there. It's also a, uh, a two chord in this key. Like, for instance, this is a one chord. This is a two chord. This is a three chord. A four, a five, six, seven, and then we come back to the... It's a one chord again because we're an octave higher now. These intervals between these different notes right here, this is the unison if I play... But if I move up here and play this note at the same time, this is called a major second. If I And we start off by counting this one as one. So this is one, two. This is one, two, three. That's a third. And that's a part of our triad there, that, or the chord that we were just playing a while ago. And if I move up here to one, two, three, four, the distance between these two pitches is a fourth. So this is a distance of a, a second, a third. This is a distance of a fourth. These two pitches they have an interval or a distance. You, it's the same thing. It, it, an interval is the same thing as a distance. But this is a fifth, perfect fifth. Then a sixth, one, two, three, four, five, six. Then this is a seventh, and up to an octave, sometimes notated as a little eight. All right? So... practice doing just that, forming that uh, triad right there, or chord, that shape with your hands, playing every other note. So this is a C chord. If this is a D, this is a D, D chord. It's a D minor chord. Um, this is an E minor chord, a, or a three chord, a four chord, which is an F chord, and a G, which is a five chord, and here's a six an A minor chord. Now, and you'll notice in some lyrics you'll see that people have, uh, there'll be just a, a chord symbol written above it, like a C chord or an F and a G. Right? They're, they're just reading those chord changes. And there's ways to invert it. We'll get to that later. But what if I wanted to take this, this lowest note of this chord, the foundational note of this chord, and move it down an octave. 
You'll start to notice also, by the way, that I've started to divide my hand into two parts, my thumb and my other fingers. Right? It's to get rhythms because I'm playing the drums on the percussion, the piano percussion instrument here. Now, what if I want to take this note maybe down lower to give more of a bass sound? This is sort of like playing drum set. Here's your bass drum down here. And then this is my snare drum up here. To E minor chord. To F chord. Move it up a step to G. Sorry. Back down to the one chord. So again, if it's based on this, that's a one chord, two, three, four, five, six, etc. Right? So that's the basics on how to get started in the key of C. And down here, I'm just going to... Each finger has its own key, so I don't have to, I don't have to look down. I, I can just feel where I'm supposed to be. This is my five. And when you're playing piano, also... Uh, when when you're reading notation, a lot of times uh, this is well all the time. This is going to be first finger, second finger, third, fourth, fifth. Right? It moves from the center out. So this is the first finger, second, third, fourth, fifth, like so. To, and it, they'll notate that way to let you know what type of fingering you need to use in order to be a play to be able to play a certain passage. So, but that's how you can get started. Again, just think boom. then up to a four chord, or the F chord, up to the five, four, just practice that to get the idea, and then we'll get into the notation of this uh, in the next video. Now the final segment of the drum set. You're thinking, I can't play the drum, yeah you can, it's not that hard. There's three basic elements that you want to start working on when you play the drum set. And you don't even have to have a drum set to start working on these three basic elements. First of all, if you can just tap your foot on the floor, that'll be your bass drum. And then your snare drum needs to be like a stack of books on like a table or desk. And then get another stack that's higher, a couple of books, to be your hi-hat. So it's these three things, the bass drum, snare drum, and the hi-hat. The bass drum, drum needs to be the loudest, the second loudest is the snare, and the hi-hat a little bit lighter. Some people go wah, 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 nah, nah, nah. This is softer, a little bit louder, and then the bass drum is the main thing, okay? So as you begin this, just, just start doing this with your right foot on the, on the pedal, and also you want to close off that hi-hat. Just close it off. If, if you strike the hi-hat later, then... Okay? First of all, just start off with going... That's a pattern we're going to be using later on. Now, on the hi-hat, this guy right here, we're going to just uh, close off that hi-hat with your foot and just lightly with the snare drum stick, with your right stick, you're going to play eighth notes like one and two and three and four and, like this. One and two and three and four and. Now, I'm not going to use sticks right now. I'm going to swap over to brushes so that you can hear what I'm saying through this microphone over here. I've got some Promark brush brushes that I like to use. Very nice. Okay, so just so you can hear me. So we're gonna do eighth notes on the hi-hat, going to one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four. You just wanna make it nice and even. Then as you're doing that, you wanna start singing boom, boom, boom. One, two, and three. Boom, boom, boom. Because if you can say it, you can play it. So boom, boom, boom. Boom, boom, boom. Then you play it. Boom, boom, boom. Boom, boom, boom. And when you strike the bass drum beater against the bass drum, you don't want it to be flailing like, like, boing, 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 like that. You want it to, to rest against the bass drum head. Like, boom, boom, boom. 
like that. So one and two and three and four, then you play it. Boom, 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 boom. And I like to kind of feel it in my hand, uh, kind of flex it as I hit that bass drum. Boom, 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 boom. Four. One, two, and three, four. One, two, and three, four. One, two, and three. So you're striking the bass drum on beats one and on the and of two and then three. So it's one, two, and three, four. One, two, and three, four. Then we're gonna start singing the snare drum part on beats two and four by saying tap. So start off with your hi-hats, on the eighth notes on the hi-hat. One, and two, and three, and four, and one, and two. Then you start singing the bass drum like this. Boom, boom, boom. Boom, boom, boom. Then you start singing the snare drum part with it as well. Boom, tap, boom, boom, tap, boom, tap, boom, boom, tap. And you may just want to practice one, two, and three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Boom, tap, boom, boom, tap, boom. Then add bass drum. Now, what we're going to do is learn a four bar phrase. It's we're going to play four measures of this same exact pattern. All right? It's a four four time signature. During the fourth measure, we're going to add what's called a drum fill. So when we get to measure four, we're going to go four, two, three, two like that. And when I came around and hit that crash cymbal, I also hit the bass drum to give us a wall of sound from the high range down to the low range. Right there. So I went four, two. And you can play any pattern. You could go just whatever. You're just filling the end of that measure. So you get to measure four, two. That's beat. When I say two, that's beat two. Four, two. And you could also, at the beginning of the measure, when you get to fourth measure, you could go one, two, three, four, like that. And I slowly crescendoed. I made a, a round of the toms. This is uh, the snare, tom, 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 and floor tom down here. I just made a, a little trip around the toms with my right hand while I left my snare drum, my left hand on the snare drum. So measure four, two, and you could also do a, a slow crescendo with the bass drum. Whatever you want to do, okay? And or you could just on the snare. Just it, you just get to be creative. So, but that's a four-bar phrase, and at the end of a four-bar phrase is when we do a fill. You don't want to do a drum fill at the end of every measure. Uh, it gets in the way of everything. You kind of just want to be subdued. A really good measure, a, 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 a good drummer, you don't notice them. It just everything just feels right. So they're not too loud. They're not trying to take over. They're just complimenting what's already there. And so, again, so let's just practice that whole little thing, a four bar phrase with a drum fill at the end. So one and two and three and four and one. And I'm just really relaxed. Then I start singing the bass drum part. I sing boom, 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 boom. Then you play it. And you sing the snare drum. Boom, tap, 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 boom, boom, Measure two. Measure three. Measure four, two, three. One. And that, when I hit that crash symbol, that's one of the next four bar phrase. One. Measure two, measure three, measure four, two, one, two, three, four, two, one. And you get the idea. So that's what you want to start working on, just starting off with the eighth notes on the hi-hat first. One and two and three and four. Then sing the bass drum part like this. Boom, boom, boom. 
then you sing the snare drum part and then you play it. Because if you could say it, you could play it. So I think that concludes our first percussion lesson one. I'm trying to get you to, to see that you can become a well-rounded percussionist that can handle all the different responsibilities. Of course, what we'll do on the, on the drum set, it'll kind of increase, but you want to practice that and you could be riding in a car um, and find or, or whatever just tap it on the floor and use your the, your your right hand on something else to be the hi-hat and your the snare drum is always your left hand you we kind of cross them over like so when we're playing so uh, you know just practice that and uh, you'll you'll be amazed if you just work on a little bit every day you'll get it <laughs>